you have a huge archive probably in, in the meantime yeah. you have come here yeah how how do you keep track of things uh, <laughs> I think people you sort of name it a lot of it is named and perhaps film based or you have to some trigger really I mean to me I feel we, you, we've always had this uh, um, process that we'd think we'd keep cataloging it but the trouble is every film comes in so fast and then we go off and we shoot and uh, we did a you know we done a film recently with Tarzan the new Tarzan movie you know um, to had all these apes and everything to make so we just went out and just recorded wherever we could apes, lions, donkeys, horses because they've all got big chests and you know you, and all these creatures are made up of multiple creatures to be honest, because you have to be able to make them talk really but in an animal world you know and the animals and things that you don't <laughs> don't do give you enough with one part one do it so you have to try and find it wal walruses and all sorts of stuff you know and we and then record days and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of it and then you, so it, it's there so you, you have to find it <laughs> so you basically uh, you personally remember the yeah, sound was associated with that film yeah a lot of the guys yeah. you know we're going to all tip and they go we, we had that we had it on that date that film there we, we, it'll be that named what it is and we do name it but the most great ones it may be within a party you know a film with this can you it's just I think we do a lot of stuff in well by association I mean we don't have a big librarian that goes and files it like that I mean we, we thought we would but we're a bit more like on the Maverick. The uh, you just get you know you're onto the next project, and then you you it's about trying to trying to do it again. I mean, we when we did Neb, was it Ex Machina recently? Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Ex Machina is it about artificial intelligence. You got to see that film. It's cool. We're trying to create an artificial like a female robot, oh, yeah. and uh, but we wanted to create sexuality with her, for that because of the way he interacts with the robot. Because artificial, you know, be through the touring test and um, so we, we, we just this is a demonstration how much that was recorded and how little of it was used but what was used is exactly what we needed not because it was bad but I went over to a guy called Nicholas Becker I went over to Paris and I rent this this studio there and it's like a bunker and the reason we go there is French and we have this idea that we would try and create um, a, a sound for the AI by by not any not using any servos or anything because she's beautiful and she she's female and he had you didn't want you wanted to be sort of a robotic and everything but you didn't want the sound to get in, in the way of what's getting in the way of their two contacting with each other so we decided we go the way of gyros you know you make them you spin them and they you, so they make this noise but they're not they're not mechanically powered they're not powered by electricity What's a gyro? A gyro. Well, it's one of these that you pull it with a bit of string and it's got, you know, they, these, they like spin. But they make different noises. So we went on the internet and we got every single one we could make, model, this, plastic, rubbish. And we got these ones that spin. And uh, and then we got, we thought we'd do that. We perhaps use crystal, crystal bowls, crystal um, things that you hit and th all sorts of things. So we went there and we set up and he must have set up we, we recorded through every different type of microphone. So, and we recorded for 12 hours a day and I was there for say three days with him. And uh, I had this idea, you know, so we, so you can imagine every time we go into a record, we shoot, it was 12 mics going, so you know, and we might shoot for 10, 15 minutes at a time, 12 times, 12, you know. So, and I would be, each time I'd go, we'd, we'd listen to a bit and the, oh, it wouldn't work. So we had all these gyros and I wanted to record the gyros under, in water. I'm gonna record them uh, f through oil and then we put them on through oil we had them in a bucket we put mics on the outside we put them on a tin box and then we put something else in it and we record it against something else you know just to get the different sounds you know but um, this with and we had all these days but the concept of that we had so so much of it but what I did there was each time I went through the takes I go you hear the take and I go but I, as I was there not later I listened to it back and go so that nick that bit so we take this little bit that might go it's like one of the bits was when the gyro was in there, we span it. We're trying to, I had this idea that the gyro going through the oil would make this beautiful sound, which would be coloured blue, because it was for a blue part of her. And I thought, you know, this, that's how you do it. You know how stupid I am. That's why I got no, you know, no certificates at school, because I didn't think in that way. So I'm looking at blue, and the, the sound had to move, but it had to move in a blue way. Uh, it felt soft to me, so I had this idea that this thing would might make a noise, you know. So you drop him in, some sort of 
do nothing. Then, then one time, a couple of times, you get the, the gyro go in, and as the oil would hit the spinning part, you get the, it went. Oh, what's that bit? And it's like over probably about eight frames. You know, like that. So it's about that long. This sound. So take that bit out, and then we do these other things, and then I let so take another little bit out, and then in the end, we were doing those great bits. We would sort of the end because they had the we'd loot them together again. So one bit go, and the other one would go, so it'd go, so and these were made out of like, tiny little bits of long, long recordings. And one of the sounds was made out of a, a serrated tea towel with a sharp knife, with the mics attached to it, then going into a bucket as well. So they would record this and it's, it's cause, cause it's a soft and you get this, it's this, this resonating thing. You know those tea towels that are washing up cloth? They've got a lot of ripples in them. It's on the table, and the really sharp knife would go across it, and you go, and it wasn't working. So it's been standing horrible. And there's one part of that from one of the mites that went, it fluttered beautifully. So that was it, and that, that fluttered, it fluttered, and it felt sort of had an essential sound to it. So we took that. But like I say, to get that one, that much sound, there was probably about five hours of recording, you know. That, that's, uh, that's how it's, you know, it doesn't sound very clever, does it? But no, no, not at all. <laughs> That it's interesting that you did that actually in France, uh, yeah. where and the French have a great r tradition with uh, sort of music concrete, uh, yeah. concrete music, uh, yeah. with uh, this using any sound and really mm. listening to yeah. little details and then they mix it, cut it out and yeah. make music out yeah. of it. Basically, uh, uh, it's I the same know. thing that we were doing. It's you know, it's the same. Th the, the same process was the same process we went through to, f to find the sounds in gravity. And in fact, some of them were shot in the same studio, you know. And um, but it's the way it's it's you know this for certain films. Certain films you don't need it when you're trying to create something different, and you want that to be different, and you don't want to use anyone else's sounds, and you don't want it to sound like a robot that's ever done. You have to figure a way how you do it, you know, or what you want it to be. And it's a starting point. Each each point has a starting point, and then you have an idea off of that. And sometimes it doesn't work at all, but you know, you, then you try again. Maybe. Uh on expanding on that, uh, when you started, you were quite very young and started on the job. 16, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what actually got you get got you going here, and, and what inspired you to, to get involved in sound? Well, well, I mean, I suppose in a way, my dad was in the industry, oh, right? Okay. He was an, he was an editor. I was, to be honest with you, I wasn't. I mean, at school, I was good at art, woodwork. I did photography and we made some films with like bowlers and but, but the story of that is my dad used to he was working on TV shows you know back in the day and uh, he when I was at senior school this was but he um he would they'd be working and they'd get short ends that they hadn't shot from the floor and we'd take them to school and we'd put them in our cameras and we'd shoot what we were shooting whatever it was then we'd put it back in the tin we give it to him. He would give it to the cameraman on the floor. They would put it in that night with the, what they shot in the door that day, and get it, and they get it developed, and then he'd bring it back and give it back to us. So it's like, <laughs> so we were, you know, we were like Del Boy, nicking a bit of, you know, using short ends that they had shot, and we had had them, and then we, we so, you know, that was that was good part of it, and um, you know, I wasn't really good at any other thing at school because my concentration levels were like, I always wonder, I still now, you know, when thinking of things, you know, and. In, in a different way um, that may be called that's probably got a name for it now that type of uh, it, it, it's I, w I would be labeled and probably that you know sent to some special school of now if that was to, if that was to be the case but um, but it, you know so I you know and I was you know I'd always I'd always worked in the you know I was a worker because I had about four jobs before I was about 13 onwards all the time anyway I got a job my dad as a as a trainee down the in the Gold Hawk Road, I was a trainee runner, you know, and on film. And I worked. The first program I worked on was um, Words and Pictures. The Words and Pictures, but over here is it, it was a kids program for the BBC, which had been. And the first thing I ever worked on was something called The Hungry Caterpillar, which is a famous kids book. And the funny thing, in from that point, working on the B, that were those BBC things, and if you're an assistant, as it were. Right from that point, you got involved working on sound because that's. That, but it's not like working on a film now that. There's editors, there's, we have decent sized teams. You just used to do everything yourselves, you know, those little programs. And also during that period of time, I got to, uh, we used a guy called, who was at the time, called Paddy Kingsland. Now, Paddy Kingsland was, you know, I didn't know him from Adam at the time, I was a 16 year old, and, but he worked, a lovely fella, and he worked at the Radiophonic Workshops 
in the BBC, which was a new thing and using sound in a different way. So I probably think that a lot of my t a lot of my um, luck in in being where I got to was a generation thing being around at the right time, not being very good at school, having to get a job and you're going to go and work there, getting into that right, meeting someone Paddy Kingston that. I'd see everyone else would you do what you know, do in those days. You would go to the, you know, you you go, you go what sounds do I need? So you would make a list and you'd go down to uh, one of the BBC. I forget which one it was called now. Um, in in Shepherd's Bush, and they'd have a room full of seven-inch records, and on those records were sound effects. Mm -hmm. So you'd have a put and you'd go for and you put a little you have a little bit of vinyl seven-inch record. And uh, you'd have a dog, you'd have the, and you would just pick these sounds, you know, and you say you need, and then they'd put them on 16 millimeter, and you go back and you put them in. And then you saw that the, from the Paddy side of you, he was going in and he was making all this stuff electronically with weird stuff, and and the kids, he was doing it on kids shows, and they worked on places like Doctor Who and things like that as well. So it, it was a different. Not everyone was doing that. They weren't even doing that in films at the time, you know. It was sort of like still going to libraries, recording it. But he was, and it was quite. I found that quite interesting that he had a. He was. He was attacking it from a different way that had ever been that I hadn't seen before, really. So, I was quite interested in that, and then gradually, I think I, you know, fell in, and I started working on. I think one of the first features that I worked as a, I was working in picture for a while on things like the professionals, and I worked on pop videos. I wasn't really could, you know. You just went to the work, you know. You, at that particular time, you want to, you know, you got around money. I'm saving up. I was you know, in, to do what you do. And then gradually got more and more into it. And then, and then I started working with a guy. I was working my day on the picture side. Then I went across and I worked with a guy called Jim Shields. who was Jim Shields was a sound editor back then. In fact, quite a famous one, even famous. I don't know if he was famous for this bit, but it was, he had done films like Alien he had, and um, uh, Chariots of Fire. And he'd worked on Battle of Britain before and he'd been around and he was a, quite a character. What's he, his name again? Jim Shields. Yeah, he's um, he was one of the, he was one of the top guys, but they worked in a di completely different way. You know, they're sort of like austere, and you know, and they're always uh, a bit different. But he was very, but he also had a very good would like to try to make different. You know, and uh, you know, I got to work for him, worked with him with, with, with Barbara Streisand and Yentl and stuff. And you know, I was, I was in there then, and then I realised that I had sort of like um, I had a you know, an, a, I could understand. I had an idea, you know, in my head. In those days, you weren't really if you work in a film, you really had to keep your mouth shut. You know, you you you, you couldn't sort of like uh, no one would let to let you know too much, or you know, you know what I mean. It was a hierarchy thing. Mm. Um, which funny, I can remember one day sitting down with my wife at the time. I said, "When I'm going to be in charge?" I was just saying, I remember this. I said, "When I'm going to charge, I'm not going to be like that to anybody that works for me. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to let them be part of it. I'll, you know, I'm not going to be this this." I'm, I I can remember sitting one night because I was a bit upset then, and I just did. That's just not going to happen, you know. If someone has to go off, they got to come. They got a family thing because it was all about. It was different, and I can remember doing that. And that, and I was going to. We're going to work as a team because I thought working as a team, working as a unit, working that you got more out of it. You know, you could express yourself. You could take, you know, that's like I said, a bunch of credits at the end of the film. But there's got to be input from everybody to make something really good, and that's what my I thought would do. And was that <coughs> the your motivation to to start your own company then? Yeah. Well, basically, when I my, my own the company side of it really was that we moved from film where I was you know I was freelance working on films and you know even to the point that um, you know digital came in and you know and then I was thinking you know this moving around this whole thing if you've got the infrastructure here you've got everything around you, you can build around you you can do more you can do you know you can do better you've got people you know and I, I wanted to build a t I wanted to build a t personally I want to build a team that was a team that would grow together that rather than a lot of what happens, you you go out and you you got to find another person, and it, you know sometimes finding people is difficult. It's not that they can't do it, but it's if you have a particular type of way of working and a style, you know we have a style which is not the same style for everything, but it's an approach to a film, and uh, you know when you when you've worked and most of the people that work with me. Have been my assistant and grown up with me. You know, they feel bad, good, or whatever, and they learn, and they're brilliant. You know what I mean? Now that you know, and it's, you don't have to second guess them. We know what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. You know, you know, and and I think from my point of view that you know, someone new. I like getting people in younger, that 
that I can so I don't have to teach. They, I love their talents and what they can do. That's what you get people for, uh, something. But you have to tame those and get them to understand that they're telling a story with those talents because I think that's the thing today. A lot of people come in and they can get on a computer and you know they can press 400 plugins in and make some weird noises. But I said that doesn't. That's not really what ever impresses me about it. You know, you know, you know. One great sound is better than you trying to fix a sound with 100 plugins. Why not get the the right sound to start with? But that that's probably because the the way my how I grew up. You know, you had to try and you know. And I always got this thing about a sound should have a start, a middle, and an end to it. And you know, a lot of it's a shortcut. Fade this crap that nets out. And it works. And then you you can do it. I'm not saying it doesn't work all the time, but. Sometimes having a brilliant start and an end, and it tells a story. Each one is is a is a good approach to it, and uh, yeah. So I mean, I you know, it's the way I, it's the way I. And then the, having the company side of it, you know, we don't, you know, it's not like mass producing massive company. It's it's like a boutique in a way, you know, that um, that we can move and we can, you know, and I can, if if a budget's not big enough, I, it don't, and but I really want to do the film. It doesn't stop me from doing the film because I haven't got enough money because I can pull resources and 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 you know work. I don't have to have earn money for that one film. I've got a year and I've got, you know whatever to make it work. But it's just so that we could do the best job for every film that I thought we could do. So you know whether it's a small budget or a two hundred million dollar budget, you want to give them you you want to give them that that sound that you want that film to have because you could you know sound design you can fit you could get it. I'm just lay stuff quickly and. Because sometimes at the other end of it, people don't know what they can achieve, so you know you can get going quicker. But you, do you know? But there is that you can go to that, but go further. And I don't mean by just putting more sound in. You go further with more, but it takes more time. Or but you, it's, and you want the film. I know we all of us as a group over there, we want to sit back at the end of the film and go, yeah, for ourselves. Do you know? I mean, I I sat. So I, I, you know, I mean, I must be a bit of an idiot, really. I, I sometimes I'll. I'll sit back I'll have at the end of a film and I know where the film started so nothing in it and then I see the film finished and I wonder how, do, how the hell did we do that you know because it's like everything's moving everything's into, you know it's got a beautiful sound to it and uh, and at the beginning and like Everest if you look at look at Everest now th there is nothing if you were to play the country copy there's nothing we used from the original we made every single sound in the film and uh, and it feels real now you know just, if you actually feel like you're here and that's to me. Yeah, it's, it's I, even today. Sometimes I think, Frankie, you know, it works. <laughs> How many? Uh, I saw last time I was here. You had a um, voice editor, a woman. Uh, Gillian. Gillian, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the relationship bet between males and females in your team? Or, well, it's I, good. It, most of the, most of the dialogue people are women. In fact, all the dialogue, that's the, yeah. and they was it's, it's riveting because they, they always get out of me that I have, you know, my sound design teams, I have more people than they do, but, you know, that's because I can. So, uh, and and the dialogue, I mean, that, yeah, yeah, she's brilliant. She's been with me for 20 something years, you know, and um, she started off and she was training, she was just this, and she came in. But she's got, with the directors we work with, they know her, and she's, she's, she's very, she's tough, she does it, she, you know, she's done anything, she doesn't overcomplicate it. But she, she's she does she's, and the dialogues. In fact, she's dialogue editing this part. We can make the film sound great unless the dialogues. I mean, I have a couple of the um, where's Gillian, there's Nina, and there's Emily, and the three and they do they do just do great jobs. And I think in in a way they're more methodical in their organisational skills, and so that's why they're brilliant at that. Whereas perhaps sometimes we are we are very we're getting it done, but our minds will go. I mean, as you probably know, it's talking to me. If anyone says to me, I start off one thing and I go to something else, and I think of something else. That's why I'd be rubbish at doing dialogue editing and get the ADR port sorted out, you know, because it's oh, God, you know, I'd want to go and do something else halfway through. Um, but they, 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 but the foundation of a good track is your dialogue, isn't it? You know, you if you if you haven't got a really good basis to whatever we do, we can't do it. And uh, you you mentioned earlier. Um, <coughs> About subtlety, uh, you're really exposed with the voice because everybody, yeah. we use it all That's every it day. All time, yeah. So our our ears are very finely tuned, tuned. To, and everybody can make a judgment. Yeah. Is that right or not right? Yeah, uh, no, so it's, and it's a simple it's thing. You can you can sense something's wrong very quickly. You don't know, you know, as an audience member, you don't know what's wrong, mm. but it's wrong. Like exactly what you say because we're doing it all day in and day out. You sync this. Sometimes one of the most difficult things for them to do is that when 
you have a performance and perhaps it's you know it's at a certain and you and during the course of the filmmaking you wanted to be more prominent with it trying to get some uh, a bigger voice in a performance that wasn't done big is very is tricky tricky to 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 sell it because if you're not careful you're it's perfectly in sync everything moves everything but you just there's something in us that senses we're quite clever we are very sensitive that is one of the things that you know and we sense things are wrong we're not quite sure why as an audience but you, and but that as soon as you feel that it, it, it makes you think about what's wrong and that will pull you out the film for a minute anyway so that so you've got to be wear, very wary of that and I do so you know, if you get the dialogues and I get the sounding looking clean and, and, and to me they've got to have a, a, a warmth to them so something that you can listen to without getting pushed away from uh, they can't be hard they can't make ear ring I've got this little thing I use and it's good to my ear if, it, if, it, if I hear it, the little, the, the, I, I can't have that you've got to get rid of that you know because it, it doesn't matter if it's on the meter or it's not on the meter or anything it's how it makes me feel and if it's if it, it, and that's and I've been nudging the, the dialogue mix we've got to cut a bit more out of that or whatever because the dialogue can push you right out of the film if you're not careful if it's too hard you know or too loud or or too soft in the wrong places it's a balance. It's a very, you know, that dialogue route has got to be right because you've got to attach the. You have to be able to attach to it, you know. And even when we've we've done a couple of films, we had dialogue. We used a lot of radio signal, you know, a lot of radio, a Everest, sunshine, and you know, and gravity as well. So a lot of the dialogue will come from that to the other. Now that's tricky because, from a sound point of view, you think, do you know what we're going to use? They're getting closer to the sun. They're getting so they're going to distort the radiation. It's going to be bad sound, wonderful. So you tend to start going down that route, and you know, and then you, what you always have to do at the end is you have to keep pulling back, pulling back, because you, as soon as you, for an audience member, you, they want to hear. Do you know, this thing about, it, that's one of the things I always think, is if we've got dialogue and the people say, well, it doesn't really matter, we don't have to hear it. But I know when I'm watching a film, if someone's talking, and I, look, and I don't hear it, I, I, you know, it drives me mad. I always go back to my wife and say, what do they say? As soon as you do, what do they say? You've missed the next bit, do you know? Then you don't. Then you don't know what that bit's the next bit. So it's, it's, it's always the dialogues, and we have a lot. Sometimes when you're final in a film, that you know that you get, is, is you really got to look at because you can get carried away with like, with like if you like the the um the flashy bits like the sound design and the music are all cool, but you mustn't f forget that core factor, which is that we are human. And we and we we contact each other. We talk to each other. And it, that's how the story is mainly told. But that's, that's a big job in, in, you know, if you get a good dialogue editor and a good dialogue mixer, it's, it's very, very important. And if you're getting, you know, everyone's good and everything, but getting that beautiful sounding dialogue is, is I mean, that is, that is key to a good sounding film as well.